we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, to my left, we have uh, Bill Bock, who's a senior vice president of finance and administration and chief financial officer at Silicon Labs. And he'll bring to the panel both an engineering perspective and a business perspective in terms of how VCs can start up companies in Texas and grow them into major corporations such as Silicon Labs. On my right, we have Bob Doring, uh, who's a senior fellow at Texas Instruments and research manager of technology and manufacturing at TI. He got his PhD in nuclear physics. He's a fellow of the IEEE and APS, and he's a major innovator in things like DRM technology and things like that. To my very left, we have Yale Pat, who holds one of the Cockrell Centennial Chairs in Engineering at the University of Texas in Austin. Prior to that, he was a faculty member at Berkeley and Michigan. He's won major awards, such as the Eckert Mockley Award of IEEE for things like inventing something called branch predictors in microprocessors, which are used by every major microprocessor company in the world. So I think we have a very interesting panel. What I'll do is I'll start off with a few introductory comments, and then I'll pass it on to Bill and the others. And uh, I've asked them to keep their comments to less than 10 minutes so that we have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So with that, if I could have the first slide. So the topic of our panel is microelectronics. Is it the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning in the sense that are more exciting things down the horizon? And we believe it is in terms of microelectronics evolving into nanoelectronics. And that's going to be the theme today. So what I did was uh, I start off with something called an example of Moore's law, which I'm sure every one of you have heard of. And this shows on the left-hand side a logarithmic plot of the number of transistors or electronic switches that you have on a microprocessor chip as a function of time, starting with the invention of the IC by Jack Kilby at TI in 1957, which is arguably the beginning of the information age. And what you see is over roughly 50 years, we've had uh, exponential growth of the transistor count so that currently we have over three to five billion transistors on a sliver of silicon, roughly a centimeter on a side. Now what's enabled this, of course, is a principle called scaling, which is shown on the right-hand side, which shows also on a logarithmic scale the dimensions of these transistors as a function of time. And what you find is, in current generation technology, you have transistor dimensions which are as small as approaching the dimensions of bacteria. They're much smaller than bacteria, and in fact, they're approaching the sizes of viruses, which puts us in something known as the nano regime, which are dimensions of the order of 100 to 10 nanometers. Now, when Moore, Gordon Moore proposed his law showing the progress of this technology as a function of time, and he pointed out this exponential growth, he also made a comment that no exponential goes on forever. And that depressed people in our field. And uh, so Gordon Moore, a couple of years later, said that although no exponential growth goes on forever, maybe you can do things cleverly and we can delay forever. And what I want to point out is, with the morphing of micro into nanoelectronics, perhaps we can delay forever. I was asked to point out the societal impact of micro and nanoelectronics, and Rich Templeton during his keynote speech already pointed out that this drives a $300 billion worldwide market, which then feeds into a trillion dollar electronics business worldwide. And in the US, this is the single largest export industry. The average person in this room, I can guarantee, owns over 100 billion of these transistors in your laptops, in your cell phones, in your digital cameras. I got this factoid from Ben Streetman, one of the founding members of Tamis. He figured out that roughly 100,000 of these transistors would fit side by side across a single grain of rice. And the economics of the thing is such that 100,000 of these transistors cost less than a single grain of rice. I don't think there's any other parallel in the history of technology where it has evolved so rapidly and the cost structure has gone down so dramatically. So what do these transistors look like? Over here, we have a cross-sectional view of one of these switches where you have a source of negatively charged electrons which can flow across the semiconductor channel into the drain of electrons. And that flow of negative electrons is controlled by a gate which is separated by electrical insulator. And it works on the principle that like charges repel each other, unlike charges attract each other. If you apply a positive voltage to the gate, they'll attract the negative electrons in the channel, and there's current flow between the source to the drain. That could be a digital bit one. If there's no positive charge, 
there's no negative electrons induced over here, the current flow is shut off, and that could be a digital bit zero. And that's how all microprocessors or digital logic works. Now, the way this thing has evolved is over time, over the last 50 years or so, we have used the principle of scaling. We have made the dimensions laterally and vertically smaller so that you can cram more transistors on a chip so that they operate faster and you get better functionality. Now, one of the problems that Rich also pointed out during his keynote speech is as these dimensions have shrunk, the number of layers that you have have gone down to a few atomic layers. And that's creating significant problems, for example, in terms of the power dissipation on these chips. And that's where nanotechnology, we think, can come to the rescue because as you make things smaller and smaller and smaller, on the left-hand side, you have things in the natural world. On the right-hand side, things that you can engineer. This is a logarithmic scale. As you make things smaller, at some dimension, we find new physical phenomena are manifested and smaller becomes different. On the other hand, if you go to the atomistic or molecular dimensions, that's the world of chemistry, you go up in this direction, and you have larger assemblies of molecules and atoms, more becomes different. So you have this magic realm where you have the nano world playing a role, where you can have new physical phenomena that you might be exploiting in new kinds of switches based maybe not on silicon, but on things like carbon nanotubes or a cousin of that, which is called graphene, which has single atomic sheets of carbon. And in fact, that's my final slide, introductory slide. So that's the kind of thing that we've been able to pursue through one of the centers centered at the University of Texas at Austin, the so-called Southwest Academy of Nanoelectronics, where Bob's going to talk more about this later on, where you have come up with new transistor concepts based on single sheets of graphene which are separated from each other. The reason I point this out is this, I think, is an excellent example of the partnership between the state government, Governor Perry and the legislature, industry, Rich Templeton and TI have been major supporters of this, and the federal government, where they've come together and have funded a multi-million dollar center to come up with the next transistor switch. And the point that I'm trying to make is, this is where I think we have a potential barrier for innovation, because if you look at what the legislature has been talking about when they meet next week, because of these budget cuts, they're talking about cutting back on education and R&D because it's too expensive. If they think investing in education and R&D is expensive, they should find out how much more expensive it is to not invest in education and R&D. So I think you know, we'll have uh, you know, the, the, the innovation continue. So with that, I think I'll pass it on to Bill Bock, and I'll ask each speaker to go on to the next one, and then we'll take Q&A at the very end.